Hey folks, this is Sanjeev from Vnex Labs and today I want to change the tone a little bit and talk to you about nanobots and SORM computing. Nanobot, uh, nanobotics is an area that I have been interested in for a long time and also SORM computing but it is something that I pay attention to once in a while because the progress there has been slow but steady and only new things come in or new topics come in that's when it becomes a point of interest for me. So uh, let's talk about SORM computing. Essentially, or, or I should say nanobotics. Nanobotics is something that uh, is explained on Wikipedia as an emerging technology field where you create machines or robots whose components are at or near the scale of a nanometer, which is like really, really, really tiny. Why I got uh, interested in this one more time, or I should say why I started looking at this one more time is because I recently read this news that scientists build an army of one million uh, microbots, or uh, even though they are, they are calling it microbots, it's actually nanobots that can fit inside a hypodermic needle. A hypodermic needle is really, really thin and it can inject stuff inside your body. So it was a really exciting uh, things. Uh, the thing is, uh, robots like this have been built before. Uh, there, was, there is something really, really cool this time around. And I'll get to it uh, why in, uh, in a minute. But uh, it got my interest uh, picked and I thought I would actually go ahead and speak about nanobots uh, one more time. So what are nanobots? So nanobots are essentially really, really tiny machines that are supposed to go in locations that are either really hard, really difficult, or pretty much sometimes impossible to get into. For example, let's say inside your body, right? I mean, either you have a surgery or if there is non-invasive procedure that can be done by a tiny robot that can do something, then a robot that size would be called a nanobot. Uh, there are, they have been available in, uh, I guess, in other places, in science fiction, so on and so forth, to, for example, nanobots that can go and repair machines and so on and so forth. So nanobots really are very tiny machines that can do a, a variety of work. The, I, I would say the origins of the idea of nanobots came a while ago. Uh, if, you, uh, if, you have no, if you know about Richard Feynman, and I hope you do, because he was one of the... Uh, one of the most important uh, researchers and theor theoretical physicists of our times. Uh, he said at one point of time, although it's a very wild idea, uh, it would be really interesting in surgery if you could swallow the surgeon. And what that really means is like, you know, uh, this is not a thing that uh, uh, he completely cooked up on his own. In the beginning, he had some idea and then he had a student and the student actually mentioned, you know what, uh, maybe there is a medicinal use to it. So he had been thinking about, uh, as in Richard, had, Richard Feynman has been thinking about nanobots and his student actually uh, further said like, no, it could be nice or it would be interesting if you could actually take uh, the nanobot in a pill form or some other form and it could just go inside body uh, and do the work. So that's where it started and uh, then the arms race actually started and uh, even before I go actually to the reality, let's look in popular fiction. In popular fiction, nanobots have been there quite a few times. And here are a few, uh, a few uh, very popular ones. For example, uh, the first one, if I look at uh, in this corner, these are Borg nanoprobes. If you are a Star Trek Greek geek uh, like uh, I am, then uh, Borgs are essentially a, uh, a species of people, or I should say they are, they are a species of uh, people who have uh, nanoprobes in their body and the nanoprobes enhance them in many ways. Like you know, they would give them uh, strength, they would give, give them better vision, they would give them ability to cope with injury and so on and so forth. Uh, there are other problems with the Borg, but uh, sufficient to say Borg nanoprobes have a, uh, another capability where they can replicate themselves and they can uh, assimilate anyone new. For example, if a new uh, species comes into contact or a new specimen comes into contact, these nanoprobes can uh, enter that person's uh, person or animal's uh, or organism's uh, body and convert them into a Borg, uh, Borg drone. So Borg, uh, the nanoprobes in that particular case were uh, showcased as a bad thing. But you could still see their power. They have the ability to give you so many advantages. For example, being able to recover from very severe wounds. Uh, and the other one is nanites. This is uh, from a, a TV series called Revolution uh, that came on somewhat recently. And these are essentially uh, probes that have the ability to reproduce, as in they can create more of themselves and to absorb electricity. So they create uh, zones that are electricity free. Uh, not a super nice uh, depiction of nanites, but hey well. The third one, uh, this one is one of my favorite ones, is uh, nanobots from a TV series, uh, from a uh, UK uh, TV series by the name of Doctor Who. So here, uh, essentially, we have uh, medical nanobots and they realize, they, they find a, uh, a, a, a kid and uh, the kid is, I guess, somewhat injured 
and so they go and fix the kid up and then there is a whole series and so on and so forth but the but i guess the key point is they help fix someone up and so it's a very positive light that these nanobots are actually presented in right so that one i, I really love even though this is not really a nanobot this replicators over here uh, i would just uh, mention them because uh, one of the things if you look into all three examples that i gave is uh, nanobots are not working as one single individual. They are actually working in a in a large uh, group together, right? If you look at the Bogue nanoprobes, you can see these black ones. These are the nanobots. There are many of them. The same with nanites. Or in case of nanobots uh, in Doctor Who, they are sort of somewhat like a dust around people. Uh, replicators are not nanobots, but they are robots that could uh, self-create. Uh, they could create more of themselves. And they used to work as a group. So they had group intelligence. Uh, so, in popular fiction, there have been many examples of uh, examples of nanobots, and so let's take a, take a look at this one. So, this is kind of a, an interesting scenario, uh, and uh, what I wanted to showcase here is that uh, nanobots are not something that we in, uh, that we thought of all by ourselves. There exist machines in biology, in human and I, I should say animal uh, biology, that uh, are doing uh, things at molecular level. Uh, for example, ribosomes, these are, uh, these are elements in our uh, body that uh, create proteins. And the way they create proteins is, you can see over here, like these are the parts that actually, uh, del these are delivery agents that can deliver the parts at the top. So this little tiny red thing over here, this is being, uh, or I should say, the little tiny red thing over here is being uh, delivered. Uh, and then this green one, this one, and this one, and so on and so forth. And the job of this yellow uh, egg-like thing, which is the ribosome, is to create a new protein out of that. So if we go ahead and click here, see, this is how it works. It actually keeps on creating this chain of proteins. And that's how you actually create uh, proteins that are, uh, that are needed by your body, inside your body. So it's actually really, really cool. And this is, these are the kind of things that we are trying to get uh, nanobots to uh, do for us. So one of the examples, for example, in 2016, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry went for the design and synthesis of world's smallest machines. This was one of the earliest uh, nanobots that we had. And all it could do was they actually put together a few atoms that could jump under certain conditions, 0.7 nanometers. That is a really, really tiny, but still this is a pretty cool concept that you could actually have nanobots that could jump up, right? And that's, that was one of the uh, awesome achievements of that day. This, the same team actually created a, a, a robot uh, essentially using small atoms and so on and so forth. This is a car, uh, car based robot, but these were still uh, very, very early. Now, if you look at the uh, limits of nanobots at this point of time, right? Uh, uh, and I'm going to get to why I was so excited about the news on nanobots uh, now. One is uh, nanobots have to be really, really tiny, right? So you're not going to be using one or two or five or 10. You're going to probably need thousands or potentially millions to perform something really, really simple. That's one of the huge limitations of nanobots. You need many, many, many of them. The second is, this one is not so obvious, but people think of robots as like, you know, they have intelligence and they can perform a lot of operations by themselves. The reality is when you have a robot as tiny as a nanobot, you will probably need a lot of them to be able to do something in an intelligent way. And the, the, the reason I'm saying this is, look at uh, it in nature. When you can look at a bee or you look at a, a worm, one individual insect has very little intelligence, but when you put a bunch of them together, they combine, they form this thing called group intelligence or swarm intelligence, and they can perform some very complicated tasks. For example, like, you know, if you look at ants, ants can actually build bridges across, uh, across water streams. Uh, they can break down some, some very, very giant like food item and they can carry it uh, from one location to another. They can search for food. Uh, one ant, very unlikely. Many ants, they can actually combine their intelligence together and, and get together and do something super awesome. So, and that is the part of nanobots, which is called swarm intelligence. You, when you have uh, nanobots, you're likely going to have to have many of them to create something, uh, to perform some intelligent tasks. The third one is how to power them, right? Uh, powering a nanobot is a difficult task. So what it really means is, uh, like, you know, you have this tiny, tiny ro ro uh, robot uh, that's going inside, uh, let's say, your body or some such place. You are likely not going to be able to put any battery inside that that's going to last in any reasonable manner. Right. So many times, uh, instead of having an internal power source by themselves, usually they will derive power from their environment. In fact, there are uh, 
some uh, where uh, some, some robots where uh, they will actually try and give power um, actually move them right so instead of powering when i say power really the reason you are giving them the power is for propulsion locomotion and uh, perform the tasks that they are doing in some cases they put nanobots in some place and they'll use a magnet outside to actually move them around to guide them so essentially the powering them becomes a exercise uh, uh, that is performed outside the environment of the of the uh, or working environment of the um, nanobot right uh, the other one is like you know uh, uh, limits of nanobots is prefabricated shape or automorphing so for example let's say like you know you are putting a nanobot in a place where you are not certain what kind of conditions it's going to uh, it's going to hit uh, and so it may need to morph to its uh, its environment and an example is bacteria and so on and so forth if you look at the amoeba right, it doesn't have any shape when it's moving around it will change its shape to uh, whatever is needed like you know when it's trying to eat something it will expand a little bit when it's trying to uh, i guess um, uh, put itself in status it will become very tiny so these things actually are also a necessity like you know what should be the shape of an nanobot in fact there is a whole field of robotics where people are uh, creating self assembling robots based on uh, based on the fact that many robots can combine together to form a new shape so that's a cool, cool thing the other one is like you know, how do you safely dispose of them so once you have uh, these unseen uh, or I should say not seeable uh, tiny, tiny, tiny millions and probably billions of these tiny robots out there in the environment, how are you going to safely dispose of them? This is one of the problems that we faced in the Doctor Who uh, uh, T television series where the nanobots, they are trying to do the right thing. They are trying to fix something up, but in the process, they make a mistake and it becomes a huge problem in how do we try to correct the problem or how do we dispose of the nanobots? And the final is ethics, right? Just like plastics today, we have plastic all over the place. We have microplastics, plastics in your food, plastics in your water, plastics in all over the place. Should we even create them? Should we even give them intelligence? Because like, you know, dealing with one robot that's giant, that has intelligence and that uh, can potentially cause problem is one thing. And dealing with something that's on a, uh, that's available everywhere that can potentially impact you without you being able to see them. That is something that we have to be able to uh, think about. Then the uh, final thing uh, I'm coming back to, which is like, you know, why I was super interested. So I put the link over, uh, well, I guess uh, here's the, um, on, on, on this page, you can see the actual reference to the article. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing. What uh, Nature Magazine just about a week back uh, published, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Uh, Miskin and so on and so forth is, at this point of time, nanobots have primarily been created uh, by bonding atoms and by doing some such process, which means commercially producing them was really, really difficult. For the first time, this team has been able to uh, print microbots, or I should say an actuator. They've been able to print a uh, nanobot-based actuator. Actuator in robotics actually means uh, things like uh, motors and so on, things that can uh, move around or things that can turn or push or pull or whatever. So they have been able to create uh, very very tiny actuators uh, using the same technology that we use to create computer chips that can actually take something like very tiny amount of voltage for example 200 microvolts and very very tiny power which is like 10 nanowatts and these are compatible with manufacturing process so we are in fact much closer now much much closer to being able to create industrial standard uh, nanobots that can be used in a ton of places so that's what makes me excited. The, uh, you can definitely find the article uh, by uh, uh, following the links, or if you want to read the actual scientific paper, you can also look at that. Look, look at it up at the Nature Magazine. And that's all I had this time. Please do subscribe to our channel, and thank you for watching. See you next time around.